Hello, and welcome to PPRC's presentation covering 13 Pollution Prevention Tips in Auto Repair. The presentation was made possible under a Source Reduction Assistance Grant from the US EPA. Today, we will discuss pollution prevention practices to minimize impacts on human and environmental health while enabling safer workplaces. The topics covered today will be solvents, harmful chemical products, identifying hazards, safer parts washing, automotive fluids, hazardous waste and wastewater, spill prevention, refrigerant management, tire management, exterior washing, and auto shop floor cleaning. Before moving on to the 13 tips, let's start with a quick introduction to solvents. These are one of the highest priorities for P2 and auto repair. There are three solvent types used in auto repair parts cleaning, water-based, hydrocarbon-based, and halogenated. From the first few rows on the periodic table, we see the halogen elements chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine. Except for iodine, these are ingredients in many of the solvents of higher concern when it comes to human and environmental health. It is common knowledge that chlorinated solvents are more toxic and problematic than most other solvents. A chlorinated solvent is a chemical compound that consists of one or two carbon atoms and at least one chlorine atom joined by covalent bonds. Chlorinated solvents can be identified when an ingredient contains chlor in the name. Fluorine and bromine are less commonly used in auto repair. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA, reports that millions of workers are exposed to solvents on a daily basis. A King County Hazardous Waste Management report found solvents to be one of the most common exposures in the workplace. Human and environmental impacts are the main concern for many solvents, especially those that are chlorinated. For humans, short-term exposure may result in respiratory issues or asthma, skin and eye irritation or damage, nausea. Prolonged exposure can result in cancer, central nervous system damage, blindness, irregular heartbeat, organ damage, development, or reproductive harm. Environmental exposure can lead to slow breakdown of chemicals in water or soil, contamination of groundwater and ecosystems, air pollution that contributes to EPA's hazardous air pollutants list, and significant aquatic toxicity. Many solvents are actually volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. These contribute to ground-level ozone, which is a key component in asthma-inducing smog. The vapors and fumes can irritate skin and mucous membranes, causing respiratory irritation or harm. This diagram shows concerning ingredients for both halogenated and non-halogenated chemicals that are used in solvents. The checked boxes indicate a high rank by certified toxicologists for each of the four categories. Note that due to acetone's low VOC, some toxicologists recommend acetone-based solvents as a safer alternative to many others listed here. For more details or in-depth information on rankings of these ingredients, please see the link provided. This diagram is similar but shows the environmental impacts. Check marks on this diagram indicate a high rank for each of the six categories. With respect to persistence, chlorinated solvents are slow to break down in water and soil, posing a threat to groundwater and ecosystems. Some solvents can remain in the environment for decades. There are three different routes of exposure, including inhalation, dermal, and ingestion. Inhalation can occur from breathing shop air when aerosols or highly volatile solvents or chemicals are in use. Aerosol solvents are especially harmful since the small particles can penetrate deep into the lungs. Dermal exposure to some auto repair products can cause serious dermal or eye to ear irritation. Ingestion is another exposure route that we hope never occurs in an auto shop. There is a famous and profound quote, the dose makes the poison. This means that the actual severity or effects of, effect of the exposure is dependent on the dose. The dose varies with the duration of the exposure, frequency, potency, or concentration of the exposure. 
Something else that can contribute to the severity of the exposure is the susceptibility of those exposed. So who are the most susceptible populations? Um, those who are repeatedly exposed, for example, employees. A second group are those with compromised immune systems. The third group is children, elderly, and pets. Children are especially susceptible because of their small bodies and developing organs. This includes the brain. In addition to solvents, here are a few other chemicals of concern that are often used in auto repair. Wheel cleaners or rust preventers that contain hydrofluoric acid or ammonium bifluoride, lead, copper, or zinc wheel weights, forever chemicals commonly known as PFAS, very low pH or acidic or very high pH alkaline cleaners, and certain types of dis disinfectants that may be more common following COVID. Hydrofluoric acid and ammonium bifluoride are commonly found in wheel cleaners and are extremely hazardous. Just 2% concentration within the formula can cause slow skin burns that are often undetectable until hours after exposure. They also severely irritate the nose, throat, and lungs. With this background, let's go ahead and get started with our 13 tips. Before warning though, tip number one will take a little bit to dive into, but after that, the rest of the tips will be concise. Tip number one is learn how to identify ingredients and hazard using product labels and the safety data sheets, or SDS. One of the easiest ways to look for the level of hazard is a signal word. The signal words are caution, warning, danger, and or poison. Signal words are typically found on the back of the product label. If they aren't there, that's a good indicator that the product should have few health impacts. Many such products are certified under eco labels such as EPA Safe for Choice, Green Seal, Eco Logo, or EWG Verified. The least harmful signal word is caution, which indicates slightly toxic or slightly irritating to skin or eyes. The next signal word on the scale is warning, which indicates moderately toxic or moderate skin irritation. The final two signal words are danger and poison which indicate highly toxic or severely damaging to the skin or eyes. If there is no safer alternative that will get the job done, these products should be used very minimally and always with proper PPE. The Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, also known as GHS, is aligned with OSHA. GHS is an international approach to hazard communication providing agreed criteria for the classification of chemical hazards and a standardized approach to label elements and safety data sheets. One of the elements include a set of pictograms that are really identical on labels and often also used in SDS. It's a good idea to train staff on the meaning of the GHS pictograms. It's also a good idea to hang a large poster at the shop so staff can readily identify hazards when they see pictograms on the labels or the SDS. Another label warning is the California Prop 65 warning. Although this is California law, it applies nationally and globally to any product that could be sold in the state of California, which pretty much means almost every product with online commerce. The law has a list of about 900 ingredients that are known to cause cancer or be reproductive or developmental toxin. If any of those 900 chemicals are in a product, the warning must be on the product label. Some may roll their eyes when they hear the term safety data sheet or SDS, but businesses are required to have them for all products used in their facility. The SDS can seem daunting, there are a few high-level tips to help understand some of the most important information the SDS is communicating. While all of these sections have useful information, the starred sections denote some of the most important. I will only dive briefly into section 2, 3, and 9. It is still the responsibility of management and staff to review and understand other topics in the SDS, such as first aid, personal protective equipment, 
or what to do in case of releases, spills, or exposure. Section two is hazard identification. There are a few different ways information is presented in section two to help understand the severity of the hazard with GHS classifications. Category one indicates the greatest level of hazard. Category 1A is less hazardous than Category 1B, Category 2 is less hazardous than Category 3, and so on. Hazard statements may be written out and sometimes preceded with GHS's perspective hazard phrase or H phrase code. For instance, H301, which stands for toxic if swallowed. GHS pictograms, signal words, and the Prop 65 warning may also be found in Section 2. Section 3 is the composition of the ingredients in the product. Here we want to look for readily identifiable chemicals to avoid toxic chemicals, such as chlorinated salt ingredients. Also crucial in understanding the hazard is the concentration of the ingredients. In example 1, we note that the ingredient, known as PERC for short, is chlorinated and makes up to 90-100% to of the product, other than a small amount of CO2. This is definitely a product to avoid. If the PERC concentration were really low, say 1%, and the other ingredients were safer, the concern with this product is still high, but much less than a 90% plus concentration of PERC. In example 2, recalling the charts covered earlier, we know toluene and methanol are some of the more harmful non-chlorinated solvent ingredients, and together they make up most of this product. This points towards a product to be avoided. With respect to methanol, this chemical is very toxic if inhaled and can cause long-term organ damage. If swallowed, as little as two tablespoons can be deadly to a child. During COVID and the extreme use of hand sanitizers, you may recall news stories of poisonings from hand sanitizers containing methanol. Section 9 provides data on physical and chemical properties. All of the properties found here are important to understand, but from a P2 standpoint, there are three that stick out pH, flammability, and volatility. pH is important as it indicates how acidic or alkaline a product is. Highly acidic or high, highly alkaline products require careful handling and PPE to prevent skin and eye damage. Knowledge of flammability and explosivity are important for obvious reasons. We talked about avoiding highly volatile products as they cause respiratory irritation and also contribute to smog. This example shows a product with 81% volatility. To compare California and the 50 state compliant requirements, which requires their solvent users in the industry and auto repair to use products with less than 10% VOC content. After learning some of the hazards of solvents and a few other chemicals in auto repair, this brings us to tip number two, finding safer alternatives. Often product label claims can be misleading and make them sound like a product is safe. This is called greenwashing. We often see marketing language such as non-toxic, biodegradable, or eco-friendly, but none of these have any le legal or defensible definitions. Remember, one of the easiest and most important things on the label is the signal word. So what are some safer alternatives? For solvents part washing, aqueous cleaners, preferably with an eco-label product, and aqueous cleaning systems. For a highly acidic or highly alkaline cleaner, it is best to stick with a product between the pH of 2 and 11.5. Alternatives to lead, copper, and zinc wheel weights are steel tungstens and plastic. Quats and bleach are asthmogens and have become more common since COVID. EPA's DFE list provides COVID-killing disinfectant brands with safer active ingredients. Safer alternatives to wheel cleaners and rust removers containing HFA or ABF can be found in EPA's Safer Choice directory. Especially avoid breathing spray products containing HFA or ABF. Recommended links are provided for additional information. PFAS is blasted throughout the news recently, often deemed as forever chemicals. They are a class of compound with a fluorine atom and a carbon atom. A way to tell if a product contains PFAS is when fluoro is listed in the name. However, the SDS may claim trade secret or proprietary information, so it is not always easy to identify PFAS products. There are several categories of auto repair products that may contain PFAS. 
such as stain guards, exterior protective coatings, waxes or polishes, lubricants, water repellent, and anti-fogger. A few suggested alternatives are provided here. Feel free to contact PPRC for assistance in researching PFAS-containing products and alternatives. Tip number three is to consider converting some or all solvent parts washing to aqueous. There are a number of aqueous systems available. Benefits include reducing hazardous waste, risk of spills, flammability hazards, and employee exposure. Bio-based washers utilize microbes to essentially digest the grease and oil removed from dirty parts. There are numerous models. Microbe-compatible parts washing fluid is necessary. Here are some of the fluids available on the market. The micro booster needs to be replenished over time and can be added via a booster product or an infused mat that is replaced monthly. One advantage of these bio-based systems over the aqueous systems, and especially over solvent systems, is that there is never any wastewater, sludge, or oil requiring hazardous waste disposal. You simply add fluid and micro boosters over time. Benchtop ultrasonic parts washers are becoming popular in smaller auto shops. The unit pictured here is 30 liters, and please notice the cleaning performance in the before and after pictures. These photos show an eco-labeled greaser being used with 10 parts water to one part degreaser. The system is greater for smaller parts. However, larger parts can be flipped to clean the entire surface area. Very large and heavy parts may not fit in the tank of a 30 liter unit and may also minimize the level of ultrasonic vibrations. Another advantage here is that aside from a little pre-cleaning, no manual scrubbing is necessary during the ultrasonic cycle, so it frees staff for other work. Other aqueous parts washers that can replace solvent parts washing include heated washers and spray cabinets. A few concerns with aqueous detergents are those that are highly caustic or highly acidic as previously mentioned. Also as an ingredient, phosphate has been banned in 17 states for dish detergent and 11 states as a fertilizer. They pose challenges to wastewater treatment plants and can pollute water bodies and starve fish of oxygen. Tip number four, when solvents are still needed, there are some that are safer than those discussed earlier. Always try to avoid chlorinated solvents, as well as methanol, benzene compound xylene, or toluene. Choose non-chlorinated and low VOC. Solvents certified as California or 50 state compliant mean that a product contains less than 10% VOC. The South Coast Air Quality Management compliant products have an even more strict VOC limit at 25 grams per liter or roughly about 3% per product. Apologies for the rather blurry images, but these marketing logos can be identified on the product label. For bulk solvents, use filtration to extend the life of a solvent. Spent solvents can be recycled with an authorized vendor, unless distillation unit is used on site for in-house recycle and reuse. Tip number five, minimize aerosol use, but when they are necessary, use them wisely. Remember that aerosols have very small particulate that can get deeper into the lungs versus breathing vapors from bulk solvent use. If solvent aerosols are still necessary, choose the SCAQMD compliant or 50 cent compliant to minimize VOCs. To minimize airborne release, replace aerosols in cans with bulk solvent in a plunger system and or spray into a rag to minimize the amount of airborne mist. Tip number six is to practice smart automotive fluids management. Always use containment under fluid drainment and replacement activities. Purchase re-refined oils and antifreeze. When dispensing from bulk containers, use drip-free pumps or siphons. Use proper secondary containment with berms, containers, or spill pallets, and label every container. Collect spent fluids with funnels or other mechanisms to minimize spills. Recycle automotive fluids with an authorized vendor. Prevent cross-contamination, especially of used motor oil with other automotive fluids or solvents. Protect and cover all of the recyclable streams from aerosol droplet debris and containment rags. If the recycled material becomes contaminated, it will become hazardous waste. Finally, everyone knows this mantra. 
store liquid waste with compliant containment and labeling. Tip number seven, diligent hazardous waste management prevents pollution caused by discharges, spills, leaks, injuries, and exposure. If there is uncertainty about whether any liquid stream is hazardous, such as sludge from car wash holding area or spent aqueous parts washer fluid, test these to determine if it designates as hazardous. Keep lids on all non-hazardous and recyclable streams to avoid contamination from hazardous materials. Tip number eight is to implement rigorous spill prevention and response. The most important thing to do is proactively avoid spills. With training and proper equipment such as drip pans, funnels, fluid transfer pumps, and containment. Train staff regularly in spill prevention response. Spill kits must be readily available with instructions on what to do if a spill occurs. Tip number nine is to contain and manage refrigerant from air conditioning units. Most refrigerants used in air, auto air conditioning are HCFCs, a very potent greenhouse gas that is sometimes thousands of times more than carbon dioxide. The tips are to use EPA certified refrigerants and certified technicians, maintain collection, recycle equipment, contain the refrigerant from any unit being removed, conduct leak, leak tests before recharging. Tip number 10 is to manage wash water from exterior car washes in order to avoid illicit discharge to the storm sewer. If a shop does not have a wash bay or holding tank, it's best to partner with a local commercial car wash instead of washing on site. Always wash over a contained bay or route the water to a holding area for treatment. Isolate storm water from wash water and vice versa, ideally having a cover over and a berm around the wash bay. Treat wash water with an oil water separator before discharge. Use soap sparingly and never use it if wash water is going straight to the storm sewer. Avoid soaps containing phosphates. Instead, consider US EPA certified or other eco-label soaps. Tip number 12 is to use these floor cleaning best management practices. Proactively prevent spills and drips to the floor with equipment previously mentioned. Stop if there's a drop and immediate cleanup. If it's more than a drop, activate the shop's spill response plan. Sweep up metal filings, dirt dust shavings, etc. and dispose these properly. Never sweep them outside and keep them out of liquid waste. Always sweep or squeegee first, then use a damp mop or an auto floor scrubber. Fill the shop floor with non-skid epoxy to prevent absorption of spills and also make cleanup easier. Ensure floor drains connect to a holding tank with frequently serviced oil water separators. The final tip is to prevent tire runoff from reaching waterways. Tires contain zinc and a chemical called 6-PPD, which is known to be toxic to salmon and other aquatic life. Tire piles sitting outside uncovered can leach these chemicals to the ground, which can eventually run off to storm drains and other water bodies. A roof or cover of some sort over the tire piles prevents water from pooling in them, which can lead to mosquito breeding. Finally, expediently transfer spent tires to the recycler. This concludes PPRC's 13P2 tips within auto repair. Thank you to the EcoBiz Auto Guide and PPRC's P2 Auto Repair webpage, both linked here. Feel free to contact PPRC with any questions.